I kind of wonder, does it show? Okay. Looks good. Okay, so we started. I'm just gonna wait like maybe like a minute just so people can uh, have time to join. Okay, I think we're okay to get started. Um, so hello everyone and welcome to the Invasive Species Center's webinar series. Uh, my name is Tara Shuchenko and I'm the science writer and development coordinator at the Invasive Species Center and I'll be your moderator for today. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Invasive Species Center honors the long history of the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis Nation people on the land now known as Canada, and strives to show respect to their ancestors, their communities, and to them individually. We greatly appreciate the significance of the lands, waters, and all living things, and offer our gratitude uh, to the Indigenous people for their care for and teachings about our Earth. Our relationships with Indigenous communities are important, and we will continue to listen and learn how we can be in good relationships with the Indigenous peoples, uh, the lands and waters, and all living things, and act accordingly. Um, the Invasive Species Center respectfully acknowledges that our head office is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Batchwana, and the Garden River First Nations, as well as the longtime settlement of the Métis people in the Robinson Huron Treaty area. I would also like to acknowledge that I live and work in Ottawa, Ontario on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people, and that I value and recognize that they have inhabited and cared for these lands for millennia. Let's see if we can, oh, it doesn't wanna to go to the next one. Oh, there we go. So just to start out a little bit about who we are, um, the Invasive Species Center is a not-for-profit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. Um, so we've got a lot of great invasive species resources on our website, including uh, species profiles, best management practices, uh, and more, so you can check us out at invasivespeciescenter.ca. Uh, you can also sign up on our homepage for our newsletter, bi-weekly media scan, and event invitations, which is where you can hear about more upcoming webinars. VISC has also launched a new invasive species training program that offers virtual courses on topics related to invasive species. We currently have two courses available that focus on forest invasives, but we'll be releasing new content regularly. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and also make sure to check out our website and sign up to receive updates on any new courses that become available. So before we get started with today's webinar, there are just a couple of things I'd like to mention. Um, first of all, there will be time for questions at the end of the webinar. Um, but if you have a question at any time, you can type it into the question box, and I will relay it to our presenter at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you're having technical difficulties at any time, um, please type them into the chat box or respond to the email found in your registration, uh, and we'll resolve it for you. Um, we've also enabled closed captioning, so if you would like to follow along that way, you can turn that on with the closed caption button on your taskbar. And finally, there'll be a very brief survey following the webinar. So if you could take the time to fill that out, we would really appreciate it. Um, and on to today's webinar. So today's webinar is titled, Biological Invasions Are As Costly as Natural Hazards. And I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Anna Turbulin. So Anna is a postdoctoral research scientist at the Great Lakes Forestry Center in Sault Ste. Marie. She obtained her PhD from King's College London, UK on the interactions between invasive species and natural hazards. For the last three years, she's been a postdoctoral researcher sorry, at University Paris Saclay in France in the Ecology, Systemic, and Evolution Department, working on the Imbacost and Alien Scenario projects. 
Her research interests are invasion science with a current focus on the thermal tolerance of the spotted lanternfly. Uh, and thank you very much, Anna, for presenting today. And I'll stop sharing and pass it over to you. Well, let's see. Oh, thanks, Tara, for the introduction. <laughs> Okay, so um, my talk today is mostly on um, the results of our study that was published recently in Perspective in Ecology and Conservation, and it compares the cost of biological invasions to those of natural hazards. So natural hazards are naturally occurring phenomena that can have negative impacts on society. So examples are landslides, floods, wildfires, storms. Most people are familiar with natural hazards, either because you've lived through them or you've heard through about them in the media or taught it at school. It's something we're generally quite familiar with. Now, there's millions of people affected by natural hazards um, every year. In 2022, that was uh, 185 million people. Actually, it's probably over that number because the data that I'm showing here is from the MDAT database, and that only accounts for natural hazards that uh, meet a certain criteria. Um, that's, for example, 10 people more that were recorded dead or over 100 people affected by the hazard. Um, so likely more people were affected by smaller um, events. Now, there's a disparity between the different types of events and how many people they impact. And this can be sometimes a bit surprising because we hear a lot about earthquakes or even storms in the media. And at the moment, obviously, we're hearing a lot about wildfire, uh, at least in Canada. But other events such as drought impact um, over 106 million people. Well, um, that was in 2002, actually, but they, they impact a lot of people every year. Um, this can be due to a certain number of reasons, which I may discuss a bit later. Now, you might have seen on the slide before that the number of people affected last in 2022 was actually a bit lower than the annual average. But if you look at the long-term uh, numbers, you can see that there's an increasing trend in the number of people affected by natural hazards globally. And that is uh, connected to, in part, the region, well, geographical disparity. Um, as you can see on this map, that's a map of hotspots that looks at um, six, well, it looks at exposure to natural hazards and, it includes six different hazards that cyclone, droughts, earthquakes, floods, landslides, and volcano. And you can see that some areas are more susceptible than others. So the areas in blue, they um, encounter at least one um, of the hazards and it would have significant impact. Areas in yellow are two different natural hazards. Areas in the red have three or five um, uh, natural hazards that have significant impacts. So areas, for example, the Japanese peninsula, um, Central America, the Himalayas. Uh, this geographical disparity, although it may look like not that many, um, not, the area is not that affected, more than half of the population actually lives in areas that are subject to at least one hazard uh, that has significant impact. In 2022, that was, oh, well, we recorded about 387 natural hazards that had significant impact. And again, you can see the geographical disparity. There were 137 in Asia, 118 in the Americas, 79 in Africa, 43 in Europe, 10 in Asia, and, and you can also see the different countries here. These are the top 10 countries that were affected by hazards in 2022. Uh, is the same data that I mentioned earlier. 
So these are only events that have had a significant impact. Now, natural hazards have devastating impacts. You can read about it on the news and you might have experienced it. So there's a growing awareness around natural hazards, um, which is compounded with climate change. And it has positioned them as a major social, economic, and environmental concern globally. When you think about all this and all their impacts, and you think about biological invasions, actually invasions can and are comparable to natural hazards. They also generate envi uh, well, huge environmental and social damage. And uh, they are well, a they are a driver of extinction and of biodiversity loss. And they are harmful, harmful to societies. They can reduce crop yield, damage infrastructure, disrupt ecosystem provisioning. A good example of this is the spotted lanternfly. So this is a species I'm currently working in, on at the Great Lakes Forestry Center. The spotted lanternfly is a plant hopper and it's native to China, Southeastern Asia. It was recently introduced to the United States um, in 2014, actually in Pennsylvania, and it has been slowly making its way up east towards the border of Canada. This little insect, which is actually quite beautiful, um, feeds on over 70 species of plants and it threatens agricultural and forestry species that includes grapes, so the wine industry, stone fruits, um, and many hardwood trees, including maple. Also impacts hops, so the beer industry is also at risk from, from that particular species. Um, how they work is that they suck sap from stems and branches, and their waste product promotes mold growth. It also attracts wasp. Actually, um, a side effect that may not have been uh, perceived or foreseen is the impact of the tourism industry as well, uh, because of their attraction to grapes and vine. They um, and a lot of weddings can be held in uh, vineyards, in such venues. The um, spotted lanternfly has that kind of impact. Um, it's because it, it nests, it has a lot of swarms, then, um, and the mold is sticky. It, it can be really um, a nuisance for, for people visiting. And there was anecdotal evidence there of, um, I think, a wedding dress or bride having had to like move them out of the way because they would stain the dress. So th these are the kind of impacts that invasive species may have. Another example uh, here in Canada is the emerald ash borer in North America in general. Um, it's really economically and ecologically damaging. It was also it's also native to parts of Asia and, like I said, invasive in North America, and it has devastating uh, effects on the ash tree population. Actually, I mean, killing ninety nine percent of trees in, in its path. Sanitary costs and biological invasions also exacerbate human health risks and cause hundreds to thousands of. Um, medical case says well, worldwide each year. Um, this is through disease emergence, um, spread, lethal bites, stings, or complicated allergies. Arguably, if you considered um, emerging pathog uh, pathogenetic uh, microorganisms as invasive species, then the annual mortality um, toll of biological invasions could be like quite substantial. Now, we've also observed really high, uh, well, massive and rising economic costs. There's a number of, of studies that have come out on the cost of biological innovations following the release of the Invacus database. and really shows that those costs are, are continually rising and in the billions. Now, there are other factors aside from impacts in which biological invasions and natural hazards are comparable. 
And these you can find in a study that came out in 2011, actually, um, that was conducted by Tony Riccardi. And it really shows that in the same way as natural hazards, biological invasions are really difficult to predict and control. This is due uh, in part to the complexity of recipient ecosystems and the strong influence of local initial conditions. Now, it was even suggested that they may be as predictive, unpredictable sorry, as earthquakes, and their timing is impossible to forecast. Although this might be true with the onset of the invasion, um, the impacts are, are more, what well, can be more predictable. They also have a similar pattern behavior. So most species only appear to have minor effects and some have cat catastrophic consequences. So if you look at the plot here on the right, it shows the log number of invasives, uh, of invasion, sorry, and the extinction event size. And what you can see is that there are um, many invasions that do not have, uh, that do not create extinction event, and then the, the numbers changes um, gradually. So very few events will have massive impacts and um, a lot of events will have fewer impacts. That's similar to natural hazards. When we talk about a hundred year flood or a thousand year flood, the, the recurrence of the event and the number of events um, that have a, a large magnitude of impact are not as frequent as those that are small with low impacts. Now, when you think um, of all the wide ranging impacts of biological invasions, the management actions to prevent and miti mitigate are still underfunded. And this can be attributed to a number of factors, whether the, like, the concept of invasion biology is poorly understood, or if there's confusion between invasive and introduced. Sometimes there's sympathy for um, invasive species in the UK. I'm just thinking of the gray squirrel, so we're reluctant to, to address it. Um, also, there's a difficulty to measure and demonstrate their impact, which is what we're trying to address here. Another factor could be the time of the invasion. And this is something that's also a, a, an issue with natural hazards is sudden versus slow onset as, um, well, hazards. And that really influences the um, perception of the impact. Now, some natural hazards like avalanches, that you can see here, or floods have um, very, uh, well, very, um, sorry, <laughs> very sudden onset and they, their impact is, is very acute and you can see it straight away, same with earthquake, earthquakes. But some other hazards like drought are, are more insidious, so they'll just creep and the impact would settle over time. Now, this is the similar, this is a case with uh, biological invasions and usually the dynamic is very complex and the impact may not be manifest until decades after introduction when the invaders are already well established. So in that case, like biological, biological invasions can be considered a slow onset hazard as well. Now, those differences means that like sudden onset hazards tend to attract more attention than slow emergent chronic ones, at least in the media. And that can really impede the rationale to invest in long-term mitigation. Another issue that kind of relates to both natural hazards and inv invasions is um, the willingness to, to, to pay or to invest in an event that may not occur in our lifetime. So how we perceive the risk uh, of that event. And I think this is something with as societies that it just is really how to, to project yourself in it. And the COVID-19 pandemic is quite a good example of that, where 
although we know that pandemic happened, they have happened in the past. Um, it, not many governments were actually ready and prepared to, um, to invest um, prior to the pandemic to uh, mitigate the impacts. And for that reason, so despite similarities between natural hazards and invasions, invasions tend to receive um, less uh, attention and they're generally less understood outside of the scientific community. Now, invested in management is underfunded, like I said, and often has been delayed. So the aim of our work really was to raise awareness of the invasion and the scale of the problem to provide evidence for policy and to really recontextualize the costs in relation to natural hazards. Now, this is to modify our vision and really highlight the extent of the damage. And it provides an understandable benchmark against something like a concept that we are more familiar with. So the impacts of, of hazards, hurricane, earthquake, and that can really raise awareness and political leverage to, to tackle invasions. So for this study, we used a range of data sources. Um, these are all publicly accessible databases that have, I was going to say global, but actually we used the US data set as well here um, for, for the cost data. The cost of biological invasions, we use the InfaCost database. So that's a public database of the economy cost of biological invasions worldwide. And it was made available in 2019, so in the last three years. The costs, the records that are available, they have been, the estimates have been compiled, standardized, described, and analyzed throughout the database. So the process was really to search for references throughout the pre reviewed and grade literature, either in Google Scholar, Web of Science, and then all these. Um, Articles were well, or documents were screened and reviewed, and uh, we assessed the relevance of them, whether the study was reproducible, and all these costs were compiled into the database, and the costs were standardized. So that means that all the different uh, currencies were converted to US dollars at uh, the 2017 value. I want to point out that actually in our study, we converted all those 2017 costs to 2020 to uh, fit the, uh, the, the other costs that were provided for natural hazards. This was done um, in 15 languages, and so it, it covers a, a large part of the world. And it also includes over 50 descriptors and at the end the database now has over 13,000 um, cost entries. For this study we narrowed our uh, observations and the entries that we used just to to make sure that it was comparable with natural hazards we only used observed costs so costs that were realized not potential costs that were um, estimated or, or, or modeled. Um, we only selected damage costs, so we excluded management costs or costs that were classified as both management and, and damage. And we also only used highly reliable, which is the classification in the cost, but really it's all the uh, costs that were deemed reproducible in the methods. For the um, natural, well, natural hazards costs, we used costs from the MDAT database. So that's, it contains essential core data on occurrence of over 20, 22,000 um, hazards. And it's from the 1900s to present day, but again, we used only from 1980 to 2029, oh, 2019. This is, uh, in part because the cost of biological invasions, uh, some of the currency exchange rates and the um, uh, CPI, so the um, index to adjust for inflation, uh, were not as accurate uh, before actually 1970, but we, we cut it off to 1990. 
Um, we used only natural hazards qualification. If you're interested in that database, they also provide techno technological hazards. Um, and we selected all continents. So just to make sure that we could get similar patterns in um, databases that were uh, just, um, well, let me rephrase this. The, there's a lot of gaps and geographical disparities at the global scale because not everyone records um, events in the same way. So to see if we were getting similar patterns uh, of the cost of biological invasions compared to natural hazards, we decided to have a key study of the United States because they have uh, quite a good uh, data, data records of both natural hazards and biological invasions. So we selected costs from the National Centers for Environmental Information, uh, NOAA, and this data set shows billion dollar weather and climate disasters across the US. Uh, we selected for the same period, so 1980 to 2019. Uh, here, this map, you only see um, the, the events for, for 2023. And um, also, the, just to, to point out, the um, over 80%, well, the 1 billion dollar weather events, they represent um, about 80% of the cost of all natural hazards. So even though it's not all natural hazards that are recorded within the US, it's still over 80% of the cost. Now, there are a few things to consider uh, before I show you the results, just because it's important to bear in mind that there's a lot of uncertainty associated with the position of economic costs from invasions compared to that of natural hazards. And uh, there are a lot of limitations when you look at the costs in general, especially when they're so hard to evaluate. Now for natural hazards, uh, here we only see the direct costs, so that includes indirect business interruptions, intangible mismitigation costs, and so on. And costs are not available for all impacts. Also, they're not they're under recorded. Now, actually, it's similar case for biological invasions. There's a lack of monetary evaluation of non market value losses, so it's quite hard to evaluate the impact to ecosystem services or just the impact to the environment. Or, like I said, what is the cost um, for spotted lanternfly? What are the actual costs to tourism and um, of that? lady or, or person um, having issues at their wedding. We, it, these are, are things that are really hard to evaluate. Um, documenting the cost of biological innovations is also really complex and fragmentary. And so all these costs are really underestimated. Which makes me, uh, lead me to say, when you look at the values that I'm going to present, really the importance is the audio of magnitude rather than just the, the precise value. And the order can change um, whenever an extreme event happens. So here we are, um, biological invasions. Uh, so the impacts often accrue, of, accrue over time. Um, but if you add them all together, uh, between 1980 to 2019, the cost of biological invasion, that's damage cost only, amounted to over uh, 100, that's 1 trillion really, um, $1,208 billion, which is a lot of money. And that comes under storms, which were the, the most uh, costly hazard over that same period. But it's just over earthquakes and floods, and quite a lot more actually than droughts, wildfires, or extreme temperature. And when you look at the percentage change between the two periods, so on the graph here on the right, well, I think that's the right here, yeah, the left, and uh, on the graph on the right, they've increased by over seven hundred percent. Uh, between 1980 and 1999 uh, and 2000 and 2019, so that's the 10-year period, which is huge. 
there's the same pattern in the US. Uh, the cost of storm is, is a lot higher, um, but biological invasion still ranks above droughts, floods and wildfire. And even if that was to change, um, they're still in the same order of magnitude. And again, they've increased um, a lot faster than um, the other hazards. Also, like I said earlier, the 80% of data, so this is 80% of the cost of uh, hazards in the US. But if you increase all these values to 100%, it, it doesn't actually change the position of biological invasions. They still remain um, second in the ranking. And if you look at, uh, look at it on a, in a temporal manner, if you look at the accumulated costs of damage through time, uh, you can really see that biological invasions have increased massively and faster than a lot of the other hazards. That's uh, glo the, the global data. Regionally, the, the ranking is um, similar, although it's variable amongst uh, continental regions. And it ranged from the costliest, actually, in Oceania, where biological invasions have the most costs accrued over that period of time, and also Pacific region. Um, but Oceania and Pacific region are the same. Um, but it's the fourth costliest in Europe and in temperature in Asia. So here is still a similar order of magnitudes than other hazard, it's just the ranking may change by region. Ah, yeah. So there are um now, well, now that we have a good picture of what the damage costs from biological invasions are, um, I'd like to make us think about a few things. First of all, biological invasions can interact with multiple hazards to exacerbate impacts. Uh, there's just a little example here again on the right. Rabbits are destroying habitats um, of threatened seabird on a remote Australian island. Um, what happened there is that uh, rabbits burrowed through the hillside. Uh, there was a, a, too much rain, the rain created a landslide, and that killed some penguins, uh, some king penguins. So this is an ecological impact, but it also works in the same way for economical costs. And it, in that, uh, other examples could be with fire, where uh, invasions can increase the risk or change the probability of fire by changing the fuel structure. Uh, which can then uh, lead to increased in landslide. So really, it's we're, we're comparing them to provide context, but one is not really that separate from another because one could in increase the cost of, of another. Now, unlike many natural hazards, not all of them, the human-mediated movement of species can in many cases be prevented or at least mitigated if we take the right actions to um, prevent um, the introduction, especially if we know they're coming. And that's something that's really important and that's something we could act on to reduce those damage costs that I presented earlier. Which is what I just said. So in here, biological invasions merit similar, similar precautionary investments as those apply to extreme natural hazards. Now, I do want to point out that it's not to uh, reduce the impact of uh, natural hazards and investments in the prevention um, of the impact of natural hazards is still really important. And I was looking at a report that was actually saying um, that a new study showed that $1, uh, $1 spent on mitigation uh, measures could save $11, well, $1 spent on mitigation measures could save $11 in post-disaster recovery. So uh, biological invasions merit similar precautionary investment, but still it is good to um, invest in prevention of natural hazards and prevent misplans. And finally, 
um, biological invasions may remain comparable to the most impactful natural hazards in the coming decades. The number of invasion is still predicted to increase. Um, we are seeing changes uh, in the frequency of natural hazards in some parts of the world that will increase and some parts that will decrease uh, with the population being um, like mostly growing and uh, largely at risk of natural hazards. This doesn't change the picture. You, you can't predict the next um, I was going to say, spotted lanternfly is on its way to Canada, and that could have devastating impact on the wine industry. Um, so new new bursts of invasions uh, will remain uh, economically costly in the same way as natural has as well. Yes, same here. So just to re-highlight everything that I said in the talk and really that's important. The cost of biological invasions are of similar magnitude than those from natural hazards and they're increasing faster over time. And just to put it in a, in a different context, so if you've never seen it, this is data that I got from uh, Information is Beautiful. It's a great site that visualizes all sorts of data online. And actually the amount of money uh, that was spent because of damage from biological invasion is not far off what um, would be needed to virtually eradicate AIDS worldwide by 2030. So again, that's just th these values here are in billion. Um, it's just to, to give you another another outlook on the extent of the of the damage. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge my, my co-authors. And so that's Ross Cuthbert, um, Franz Assel, Philip Park, Anthony Ricciardi, and Franck Cochon. Especially Franck for acquiring the funding uh, to, for the whole Invercost project and for the AXA Research Fund. I'd like to also thank Christophe Diane, Elena Angulo, and Boris Leroy. Uh, for their ongoing feedback. They're uh, core members of the Invercost team and uh, we, we discussed those costs quite, quite a lot. And finally, these are all the people that were involved uh, with the building of the database in one way or another. So thank you for, for making the cost estimates possible for biological invasions. And that's been done. Uh, thank you for your attention. And yeah, now I'll take questions if there are any. And just looking to see if we have, looks like we got a question. Um, so the first question uh, is of the biological invasions considered in the analysis, were there certain taxa that dominated? Uh, yes, so for this study, we haven't looked at the breakdown of the taxa, but um, in, in other studies we have, and insects tend to dominate the cost of biological invasions. That's good to know. Oh, another question. So did you include diseases or pathogens as invasive species in this context? Uh, and do you think they would follow similar trends if you didn't? Um, I have a big of this. I think they were excluded. And yes, it would still follow similar trends. Uh, in the sense that it would be comparable uh, to natural hazards, at least the cost would be. It's good to know. I'll just give people a couple yeah. more minutes if they have any more questions. Uh, let's see if I have any questions. Um, I guess oh, uh, I have a question if you have. Yeah, well, so you mentioned precautions taken to sort of mitigate the effects of um, invasive species. Uh, yeah. Do you have any like thoughts on what precautions could be taken? Mm -hmm. um, well, I have many thoughts on the, how the precautions could be taken, but there, there are 
um, different agencies around the world that do look into how we can uh, minimize and that's through border control um, and that's one of them sharing information citizen science actually is a really good way to do early response when you spot um, digging invasive i guess modeling as well if we are aware of um species that could um that are invasive nearby in different countries and how that could impact um well similar similar regions and well, I guess there, there are many other ways to 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 prevent. Um, Thank you. Oh, there's another question. So, um, do you feel there are any cities or countries that are doing a good job to reduce invasive species? Mm -hmm. So, a trick question. Well, it's not a trick question. It's I'm not aware of all that is going on across the world. Um, I know that many places do try to have regulations and legislations in place um, to, to mitigate invasive species. I wouldn't know of particular cities, actually, but I wouldn't be surprised that some local, local communities are quite invested in um, in by preventing introductions um but yeah i some countries have more regulations than others is what i can say uh so another question so this one says great work so you've had also another person in the chat saying awesome presentation. Um, and the question is, do you know of any efforts to compare costs that government agencies are spending on preparedness to natural hazards versus invasive species prevention uh, and early detection and rapid response? Well, I've been looking into this, but it's really hard to get that information. Um, I mean, I, I work for a government agency, agency, but getting spending from agencies uh, is not the easiest of tasks. And it's the same for natural hazards and for uh, invasive species. So it's actually quite hard to get that information. It's not impossible, it's quite hard. Uh, there is information available from insurances for um, natural hazards. And there's the UNDR or DDR, I can never remember that acronym, which is, it deals with disaster, disaster risk reduction. And I think they've ha they have a report that talks about um, again insurance and, and how much is invested in prevention in there. But getting the actual data is, is yeah tricky. Although it would be really interesting. Yeah. Oh, so we got another question in the chat. So um, with natural disasters, often a dollar value can be placed on the value of investments in mitigation based on what damages were prevented. Are there many data which estimate the value of investments into invasive species prevention? And are there different challenges with making these estimates for invasion versus natural disaster? So the as a, yeah, it's a great question. There are, there's um, a study actually, I'll put the, the links in the chat. Um, there's a, at least a couple of studies that look at the, the value of investment into invasive species prevention. And one of them using um, the Invercost data, which really shows that, um, you, well, you could save a lot of money by investing in prevention rather than dealing with the damage. And um, I'll, I'll put the link to those studies in, in the chat. So there are a few of them and the data is available, um, but the, these are based on models and the cost of inaction, for example. Uh, are there different uh, challenges we're making here versus natural hazards? I think there are different challenges, but the, the the methods are probably 
applicable from one to another. Um, so I have another so I'm reading the question. Yeah, so there are different, somewhat different, but actually one can be applied to another. It's, it's as complex to do. Um, hold on. But I'll, I'll dig out the studies and put them in the chat now. Thank you. Let me stop sharing. Can we do that? We'll just see if there's any other questions coming in. So uh, another question has come in. So the um, question is, how does your findings relate to SLF? Once you've got the... Did my answer go in there? Uh -huh. no. I think you can also type them directly into the chat if that's easier. Oh, there you go. Uh, spotted lens of travel. What was sorry? What was the question? Oh yeah, no. Uh, so the question is, how does how do your findings relate to the SLF in terms of cost and how they compare to uh, natural hazards? Um, uh, um, I'm not sure how to answer that question. So spotted lantern fly has wide economic impacts and. I guess, in, um, well, we're still evaluating the the extent of those impacts because it's still quite a recent invader to um, North America. It arrived in 2014 and not everything's been established on the extent of the economic impacts. Um, but they will certainly contribute and increase that figure that I, I showed earlier. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not too sure how, how to to add to that question. Um, is is just a, another good example of how an invasive impacts both um, ecologically and economically on um, well, societies. Um, I could talk in more length about spotted lens and fly, but it doesn't quite uh, relate in the same way to natural hazards. Um, yeah. yeah, that's good to know. Um, oh, we got some more questions in the chat now. Uh, so the next one is with increasing awareness of the impact of invasive species. Do you think that with the increasing number of reports, the cost of invasive species might become greater than the cost of natural hazards? Oh, uh, that's really hard to tell. Uh, I like it could, but I think it might be a game of of like sometimes it could overtake. As well, some years it could overtake, and then it might not overtake. So over over time is is really hard to tell. You could have, uh, let's say, a massive hurricane that or a tsunami that is going to have a huge impact and economical costs uh, that were not foreseen. So it, it's again, it's the a thousand year event versus versus not. And in the same way, you could have an invasion that behaves in the same way as the pandemic and 
could have huge costs that would yeah take over the cost of natural hazards. So they, uh, I'm pretty certain they will remain in the same order of magnitude, but whether they'll be greater or, or not is is hard to tell. Um, the greater awareness does have an influence on the number of rep reports and recalls, and that have increased over time. But we showed that um, even though there's an increase of reports, it, the, the the costs are still higher than the number of um, what's been recorded over time. If that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then another question we have uh, is, as climate change accelerates the cost and frequencies of natural disasters, it also changes the range and impact of some invasive species. Do you have any suggestions for how to look at this or if there are any publications you know that address this specific climate change aspect? Um, well, actually, I uh, co-authored a book chapter on climate change and invasive plants that I can share. Um, but the, there are many publications that look at um, the effect of climate change on uh, biological invasion, and uh, one of them actually I can probably link into here. Um, and it will, it, it's like everything in some areas, it will um, retract and uh, or decrease the presence of invasive in some areas, it will increase um, the, the range and open up um, changes, biotic and, and abiotic conditions so that uh, invasions can establish, um, well, species can establish more, more easily in a, in a given environment. Um, I will yeah, I, I, I will point to, to different publications, uh, but there are quite a lot on the topic. It's going to be quite tricky to address, um, that's for sure, but in the future. I think one way, a uh, recent article was on sleeper species, so species that are currently established, not well, that have established population, but we haven't yet uh, spotted the impact of those. And um, the knowing of those uh, sleeper population could be a useful tool to actually prevent um, invasion, like full-blown invasion and limit their impact, knowing that they're already there or nearby, but haven't exploded there because they might be limited by a, a climate-related factor. Um, but I, I will put a link to one of the publications here. Okay, that's good, that's good to know. Uh, and while you look for that, I'm just going to put a reminder that after the webinar, we'll have a uh, survey that you can fill out. So um, I'm just uh, reminding everyone about that. Um, There. That's great. Um, well, thank you for all your comments. Yeah, you're getting a lot of uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, very interesting, very cool presentation. Oh. Great. Um, yeah, and I think that's the last of the questions for now, unless anybody has anything. Last minute, they want to put in the chat box. Um, yeah, if you just... have more, sorry, if you have more questions that you think of, just feel free to send me an email. Uh, maybe slow to respond, but I will respond at some point. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Anna, for presenting today. Um, it was a really 
interesting presentation. So thanks for sharing that with us. Um, yeah, and I guess I will end the webinar for now. So thanks very much again for- Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for listening. Yeah.